Welcome to the Sean Trey Show. I have a really awesome guest with me today. Now, would you like to introduce yourself and tell people who you are and what you do? Yeah. So, my name... I have a couple names, but... Uh, oh, do tell. <laughs> Sometimes I'm Miss McGarity to um, my elementary music students. I'm mm-hmm. also Julia to my friends and colleagues. And then um, a lot of people out there know me as Jude Magnolia, which is my, my music name and also the name of our group. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So there's a lot to unpack there right there. <laughs> so, so let's, uh, before we started, you were talking about how, um, you, you are, you know, gifting music to the next generation. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Now, mm-hmm. Tell me, tell me about what, uh, how, how you are teaching kids music. Talk, talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah. So when I first started, um, I was teaching for the Montessori schools in Portland. So Mm -hmm. I was teaching children from walking up to the age of three. So um, I was able to cultivate so much joy um, at the beginning of life and and also learn joy from these Mm -hmm. children. Um, And it was amazing because they would go from, you know, learning how to walk. And by the end, that they would be singing. And sometimes they'd be singing before walking. Um, that's awesome. And, yeah, so that's kind of, like, where it all started. But, you know, in my day-to-day, I teach six levels, so kindergarten through fifth grade. And oh, wow. this is my um, fourth year with the same children, so they really do feel like my music babies. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so, we're both each other's like number one fan. I get to try things out um, and, and listen to their feedback and they're very interested in what I do. And Mm -hmm. um, it's just cool to kind of bring music or something that you love full circle when you're able to actually practice what you preach. I know it's cliche, but you know, I'm continuing to develop myself Um, and bring that new information to them. There was this great quote that when you, I can't remember what it was, but through teaching, we learn. And it's like, there's so many things that like, I understand at a deeper level when I kind of try to teach that to someone else, whatever it is. And so I have a special place in my heart because I, I've been homeschooling the last year plus, you know, with everything (laughs) that's been going on with COVID Mm -hmm. for my daughter. And one of the things is I was like, albeit I have a background in education I still was way out of my element, way, way, way out of my element. And one of the things that I did was my wife is a famous singer here in Vietnam. And so our daughter is, has been around music since a young age, but I wanted to give her like a ton of exposure to different types of music. So I went out and bought a bunch of cassettes and CDs and records, everything I could get my hand on. Mm -hmm. And because I wanted her to like see as well to hear kind of some of these sounds, you know, what does a cassette sound like? What does a record sound like? And what does music from that sound like in CDs and all that? And so I've just, I cultivated as much as I could because so much, so many of the people that I get on here talk about how the foundations for music were laid so early in their life. Mm -hmm. And that's where, again, why I wanted to bring up what you were talking about to transition to the next question. (laughs) How did you get started in music? So, yes, I got started in music when I was just three years old. So my, my mom found this like amazing teacher that taught me how to read music by color. So we had, I know, so creative. Um, There was like this little tiny toy piano and on the piano, um, each like note in the octave scale was a different color. And so I was able, because I knew my colors at that age, I was able to make the connection between color and like when to press the right key. Um, So we started really early. Um, I play the piano all the way through high school and of course still now and played very uh, competitively for a very long time. And it's awesome. Yeah. And then I also simultaneously was learning how to play the viola starting in about fourth grade. And then I took that from elementary school all the way through my studies at the university and went on to play in the symphony there. So I had a very um, 
robust upbringing with music. And, and I did have that foundation that you were talking about. Let's see that. That's just like, I'm still, I'm still circling back on the colors thing because I've like, I've been teaching my daughter and it's such an interesting way because mm -hmm. what's really special about that is that, um, not everyone learns the same. And I had such a hard time with sheet music. Mm -hmm. And so that color, it, it's like, a, it's very much, I love the idea of adapting mm -hmm. the, the training to people as they come in. And so it's really powerful that you had such strong teachers early on that were creative with your teaching. Now, now, after you, you, you got through all that, when was the moment that you were like, you know what, I, I, I want to do this. This is something that I want to do. Yeah. When was that? That's a, another great question. Let's see. Um, so uh, probably in high school, um, maybe towards the end, and then into like my early 20s, I actually quit playing all music altogether. Um, really? I Yeah. And I think that there's some musicians that might have similar stories just in the way that um, I think that we prioritize skill over oh. over developing um, a cultivation of love or a healthy mindset for um, continuing music. And I, I had no love for it. You know, I was like doing competition after competition and not feeling connected to what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I first started college, I was like studying psychology and mm -hmm. art and um, you know, just had wanted nothing to do with it. And then I had a friend, um, passing through from Seattle and they left this, um, really cute, like backpacking kind of, um, classical guitar and they left it with me and I picked it up and I mean, was it, was it like one of the little travel Martins? Oh, uh, it wasn't a Martin. It's like, it was probably That's like, it's like this wildly colorful guitar probably awesome. from like the late seventies or something. It was oh, like, wow. So, orange and embellished and that's awesome and also really easy to play because it had nine on strings and mm. i just remember like sitting on my back porch and at the time we kind of like lived in this like, tree house kind of place where there's a big tree overlooking and i spent hours and hours and hours and hours just teaching myself how to play guitar and that's when i really just fell in love with music on my own accord, maybe for the first time. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's really awesome. The, there are, I've, I've heard of some people that, that had like a, a musical renaissance when they, 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 mm -hmm. they, um, you know, people would learn one instrument, but then it wasn't when, and so there are some people that I, I had one or two people that came on the show and they're like, yeah, I was three years old and I knew I wanted to be a musician. And I was like, wow. Three, I had, I had no idea what I was, I was, I wasn't even conscious at three, you know what I mean? And, and so I was like, just like, well, what am I doing here? Milk? I like milk, you know? But, you know, but there are some people who, you know, get these early musical experiences and then they go later on after trying other stuff, they come back to it. So it's really interesting. Now, what, what did you study in university? Wow. Um, I studied a lot of different things before I finally went back onto the track of music. I studied mm -hmm. uh, creative writing, psychology, art, also farming. Like I was out there. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, like learning how. That's to actually grow, awesome. Learning how to grow corn and tomatoes, and like being really connected to all of those things. Um, before I actually ended up dropping out of school having, having a moment, a needed moment, and then coming back and deciding that, you know, I had all of these skills with the viola and I still needed to take a break from the piano. So I auditioned and was able to, um, be accepted into the school of music and play with the Portland state symphony and have, which is amazing. Yeah. And have a wonderful teacher to my, uh, viola teacher, Brian Quincy. He, plays in the organ symphony so you know i i had some really amazing training from that experience that's so huge it's so huge that like well one of the things that's really beautiful too is like you're 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 a multi and multi-instrumentalist which is super interesting to me mm -hmm. these these people that are able to kind of tackle more than one 
more than one instrument. And because albeit, you know, they all operate on the same musical scale. They sing differently. Mm -hmm. If that's, does that make sense? Like there's, there's really like, um, you know, (laughs) a person who's approaching the bagpipes, it, uh, the bagpipes are very different from a drum, which is, well, hand those are, those are bad comparisons. Bagpipe versus a piano versus a flute versus a trumpet. You know, you know, the piano is going to be something strikes and then the different resonance that carries off, you know, versus a wind is going to be the intensity coming and going from, from breath control. And, uh, you know, bagpipes are just that crazy melodic <laughs> droning on, and on, which is awesome, especially if you're riding a unicycle or dressed like Darth Vader, which is an actual video on the internet. Oh, oh yes. Yes, I know. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. So, so talk to me like, um, about then your journey. Um, when did you find the cello? Oh, sorry. The viola. Oh, viola, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're good. Um, that's been like, I think that the viola is such like an interesting instrument because people are like, what? That's a real instrument? And I'm like, yeah, it plays in harmony, you know? Um, but in mm-hmm. a lot of ways, it's like a cello. It's like a baby cello because mm-hmm. it has the same strings. Um, yep. But yeah, I started playing that when I was in fourth grade. And then, you know, playing all of the music and the symphony and like learning from the greats. Um, I really enjoyed it, but I wanted to break all of the, the constraints and the constructs of that music. All of that music is, is written by old white men (laughs) and (laughs) and, and not just being, not like identifying and connecting with that. Um, I just took it upon myself to start improvising a lot. So after school, I was able to play in a lot of groups and let go of that scripted cerebral type of playing and really get in touch with um, a spiritual connection to how I wanted to play that instrument. There there was this one great Nina Simone like clip Mm -hmm. where she was on stage and she was playing some Savage. Just, she was just doing some amazing Nina Simone jazz and she was playing piano. And then all of a sudden she shifted into Bach and like, cause she was a very highly trained pianist and she shifted into Bach and then she shifted back into her jazz. And it was just like seamless because for her, she was doing it her own way and it was just the music. It was just the notes and there was no constraints. It wasn't Bach play the way, you know, it was traditionally played because it's, it's so rigid. Like you're saying, like it it is so rigid and that's so beautiful. Like that you talk about this spiritual connection to the music. Can you tell me more about that? I have an idea, but I would love to hear how you appreciate that. Sure. Yeah. Like when I was, um, when I had the guitar and I was writing on the back porch, yeah, and um, really connecting with being honest and present with myself instead of aiming to please mm-hmm. other people and writing all of this music that was purely for myself on that first album. I was doing it as a meditation. Um, a, I love that. A lot of um, what I was playing was... I don't know, I think kind of outside of the Western framework of music. I think that Mm. when you look at examples of Eastern music, there tends to be more examples of like this like slow unfolding um, and this patience and this idea of like lavishing in the moment. And I think Mm. in a lot of Western music, we're really interested in, in the start in, in the build, in the climax, and then the come down of like, of like yeah. the song. And mm-hmm. I think just kind of being able to throw out some of those pre prescribed ideas and really understand what I needed to hear. It helped yeah. me heal, but also connect with a spiritual self. I love that. I, I grew up singing in gospel choirs. Oh, cool. And, and so 
the idea of like that, that, you know, we would sing a song and sometimes they would just keep going mm -hmm. and it would keep going and keep going and keep going. <laughs> I remember once we had a 20 minute song and it was just like, because people were in it and people were improvising and this person, the whole group was improvising and we just had to be in the choir had to be constantly present for cues mm -hmm. and he would give us a cue and you watch the director and it was this this very much i grew up studying um philosophy and and in university i studied like uh eastern philosophy especially with buddhism and zen buddhism and and the i loved the early zen buddhism and i studied um a lot of the the chan buddhism which was the zen that was originating in china <laughs> that then it moved into vietnam and korea and and um and japan and became what we now call zen but the these were the guys that were like it was a great one where like there would always be the idea of the koan and that was something that came out of out of out of uh japanese buddhism but the, the the idea was still there right what does that mean people would be like what is the buddha and the guy's like you know look at the one like a donkey running down the hill and people are like what, what does that have to do with anything and the idea was we try to get into our head about meaning but what what was really important in this type of philosophy mm -hmm. is the experience mm -hmm. it's like if you're sitting there and you're getting all philosophical and there's a, a three-legged donkey running down the hill, <laughs> that's something to pay attention to. You know, and that, that's an actual koan. That is an actual koan. What is the name? What is the Buddha? It is, you know, look at the three-legged donkey running down the hill is an actual koan. And so I was like, that's wild. That one stuck in my head because I was just like, I don't know what a three-legged donkey looks like running down a hill, you know. But if you see it, you're going to pay attention to it, you know, or at least you should. And in a world so preoccupied with this or, you know, and other things, the, 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 that present moment experience is powerful. So I, I love that you bring up the spiritual nature of music. Have you ever had a piece of music that has affected you deeply in a, in a spiritual way? Yeah, this is going to be, <laughs> it's kind of funny because I'm, <laughs> I was just like, oh, I don't really want to listen to uh, I don't want to play classical music, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, Spiegel and Spiegel by Arvo Part, I believe, is probably one of the most um, opening pieces of music for me. I just I remember driving like over the I-405 bridge, listening to this one morning and just crying because of how, yeah. how, how beautiful it was and mm -hmm. how, um, you know, how patient it was. Oh, you know, I love that. Just, just giving yeah. the time to, to really be there. And that's, that's, you know, a part of like the aesthetic that I really appreciate. So, yeah. 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 And there's something, there's something about strings as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, the, I can't, I don't know how you pronounce this, but, um, there is, a, 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 I think they are European H A E V N Haven oh. or something like that. It's, it's not H A V E N H A E V N or something. Huh. And the song is we are symphonic or it, and it's like done with a live orchestra and it's like and when you hear the strings and it's just this piece and it's just like wow and there's something about the about about strings that has always struck me deeply so i always respect people who play the strings it's just amazing the most unforgiving instrument you can play oh yeah yeah <laughs> you have Tell to me, talk to me about that Hello. talk to me about that <laughs> it's kind of funny because we're doing the same thing with like my kids at school and like learning yeah. ukulele um mm -hmm. but it takes a tremendous amount of mental and emotional energy to sound ugly for so long, right? Like having the muscle memory to remember yeah. where each pitch lies and then also having the confidence to have it speak. So, so yep. I think that, you know, 
it is, it is really hard on the mind and, and you have to find ways to forgive, forgive yourself in those moments and continue to push forward. So I think I've learned a lot of, instru- or a lot of, just a lot of information from playing a string instrument. That's awesome. I, 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 I've never heard it that described so accurately. <laughs> Because I had to sound so horrible for so long. I took violin as a child. Ooh, you know. And I never, <laughs> and I never ever got to the point where I thought it sounded good because I was just like, I, I looked at my mom, I was like, let me p- play piano because at least that sounds, no matter how, it's not, it doesn't sound great, but it doesn't sound awful. Mm. And I, I, when I played the violin, it sounded awful. And I love the violin. It is probably one of my favorite instruments. Aww. But I, not when I played it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. For sure not. Yeah, but, you know, you never know. My friend, I, I respect my friend Michael started studying uh, the violin when he turned 40. And I was like, that that's beautiful that people are willing to try to go back at something. Yeah. Talk to me more. Now, now you studied these, the, these instruments. When... How did you get into the group that you were part of now? Yeah. So I had many different like projects over the years. Like I did solo stuff. I played in a lot of different groups around town um, and tried to start harnessing, you know, my ideas. And it took, (laughs) I mean, it probably took a good like seven or eight years here, you know, going down the the wrong path in the maze <laughs> until I finally right. found <laughs> my you know my family like my my musical soulmates like each of them I love that I have a big band we have you know seven people total six of us regularly performing um and they are the best people that I could have ever put on a team together um Jessica, she sings uh, backing vocals for for the group. And, you know, she has been with me since we started college. So she she was there That's studying awesome. music education. We went on to get our master's degrees together. And she's also another elementary music teacher. So we are like very bonded. Um, Devin is uh, the vibraphone player and plays guitar. I met him by playing in one of his bands and now he supports me. Uh, also met. So awesome. Yeah. Also met our bass player through that group. Um, Tim, the bass player, and then Alex who plays keys. They both went to Berkeley. Like they, 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 they had all the chops. They did all the things. And I'm just shocked still that they're like, I want to yeah. play music with you. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, <laughs> like, sure. Like, let's do this. Like let's do it. a lot of times I feel like I have imposter syndrome. Like I'm just like, Right. I guess I'm, I guess I'm cool. I guess, <laughs> but yeah. And then Sasha, he, uh, is our drummer and he, um, is the audio engineer at Dead Aunt Thelma's recording studio. Okay. Um, and I just met him online, like seeing what he was doing and then seeing sometimes that he would have like a drum video, but he wasn't playing in any groups. And he's just turned out to be this extraordinary drummer that is being able to utilize all of his music background outside of um, being a recording engineer. That's amazing. Yeah. It's cool too. And, and a couple of things that you pointed on that. The one first thing is like imposter syndrome. And then the, uh, I, I want to talk about finding your tribe, but <laughs> one of the things that's a lot of people come on and it, even people that are really, 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 like established in their profession have talked about imposter syndrome to me, like people that are, you know, you know, a DOP of a major movie, you know, and they're like, I sometimes like, I don't think I feel like I know what I'm doing. You know, it, it's certainly you've been there. You, they've, they've got the experience, but I, I think that so many people deal with the, it's not uncertainty, but just the lack <laughs> momentary gaps in, in, in confidence mm-hmm. would be how I describe it, you know, and, and just, you gotta, kind of, now how do you get through your, your feelings of imposter syndrome? How do you get beyond that? Um, you know, I think that's a, that's a great question. I think that identifying as like a multiracial, 
young woman. Um, my mm-hmm. mom is from Korea. And my dad, um, he's from New York, but his um, family originally came from Ireland. My last name is McGarity. It's very Irish. <laughs> but kind of having this like perspective of um, from a young age needing to assimilate into mm. um, into white culture and mm-hmm. being identifying as as Asian, I think that the typical role that is prescribed to us is being gentle and being polite and not asking mm-hmm. for a lot, not taking up a lot of space. And so mm. I have to constantly undo those constructs that have been given to me by society to say, hey, listen to me. I have ideas. I have energy. Yeah. Um, and I've gotten through that by going to where I am celebrated and not tolerated, right? Heck yeah, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think that that's a really good point. Like, as I'm raising a daughter that is multiracial, mm-hmm. that in it's kind of the opposite. She is uh, half Vietnamese, mm-hmm. half, half American. Mm-hmm. And she deals with this, like, because we're living in Vietnam right now. Wow, yeah. And so, and so, I and I, I'm, I'm, I'm planning a move back to the U.S. in the next couple of years. And so, one of the things that I have to process is like prepping her for that mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. she's just, you know. But luckily, luckily, her mom is an absolute force of nature, and. uh and it is teaching her with that. And so it's like, I'm thankful for that, but it's tricky when people have, I think we have a lot of, is it a kitty cat? It's my dog. dog. He, my dog knows how to open doors. Mine does as well. It's crazy. He just barged in here. Um, it's, okay. it's okay if I go shut the door really quick. Totally. He's looking for mom. And he's like, where are you? Oh my goodness. Nico. If mine is naughty, my, 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 uh, my dog will get shoved in here by my wife. <laughs> yeah. He's so funny. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome well I, what i was gonna dive into was yeah gotta love dogs first and foremost they they take the, any tension out of any interview if you're like dealing with anything heavy or serious the dog's like hey what's up i'm here <laughs> focus on me but one of the things that you were pointing out is um was that about we were talking about you were learning to celebrate yourself and i think that's so important because we are all unique and different and special and no one fits into any mold yeah whether you are whoever you are i mean i i was always an outsider Mm -hmm. just because i was i was weird i was different i was a weird kid man and i changed schools a lot and i my dad and so we moved all over the u.s and so even for me like i came from new england and then we moved down to the south Mm -hmm. and moving from new england to the south that was a different culture and then we moved from the south to the pacific northwest pacific northwest to texas and texas to california Mm -hmm. it's there is so much like um people like to put other people in boxes Mm -hmm. because it's easier for them oh yeah right Mm -hmm. it's way easier this is how you should act and it's like well that's not who i am Mm -hmm. and when we get so many people that kind of put that on us Mm -hmm. and 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 it's really powerful that you that you're able to find your own self-expression are there anything that any um what are some of the, the, the things that inspired you to, to find ways to, 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 um, I, mean, I love the way you said it, uh, to, uh, 
I'm blanking on oh, how you said uh, that. To be to like to, to be celebrated instead of tolerated yeah. by your peers. <laughs> how, 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 how do you, how do you go about doing that? Like, what are some of the things that you can do? Uh, this is advice from another elementary music teacher that I took to heart. And when I got some of that recognition from NPR this past year, um, which awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Just to have like Bob Boylan, like review or even listen to my music. I was just shocked, you know, with like our culture, but also like what they're doing and, and them seeing me. And, um, yeah, one of my fellow colleagues like came up to me like at a meeting and he was like, I love what you're doing. And he's like, you got to follow the heat. And I was like, tell me. I was like, I was like, what? And I I was, I was actually like confused for a second. I'm like, heat, I'm making music. What are you talking about? And, and he's just like, you're doing things that people haven't heard before. Like you're playing in 15, eight and going back to four, four and like doing all of these like very, um, unique things and he's like you always got to follow the heat find find where this strangeness find find where this newness and this openness is coming from and surround yourself with that and I absolutely think like the people that I have around me right now they're they're open to exploring these uncomfortable parts of ourselves or transitions or or types of music where in the past, you know, like I would have an idea and people would be like, that's really weird. Or that transition doesn't sound right. Or that sounds like mm. two songs or mm. this song is boring or whatever feedback I was getting. It was because I wasn't, I wasn't able to follow and, and be attracted to the heat and the energy that others were putting out. I was like more interested in like, fighting into into paths that didn't didn't allow for that yeah there, there was an interesting thing that i was talking to a uh, a musician from australia mm-hmm. and one of the things that we were having this really interesting conversation about people approach so many things with structures and systems that don't necessarily see the fullness and richness of what exists. Mm. And let me give a very specific example. He was talking about how the current DAWs don't necessarily support music from other cultures. Yeah. And so he was pointing out, like if people from India are, you know, certainly you, you can't use some of the, um, quantize features or not some of the auto tune features are not necessarily going to work because it's applying it to the, the, the grid, the musical grid that is, you know, what we have established in the West, you know, that are the note structures, but I'm really excited to, um, to interview this one gentleman in the next, next month, um, who's from Turkey and he plays a special guitar that is oriented towards the, um, the, the note structure. I I don't know how you would call that. There's a specific name for it, but I can't like, it's not the note structure, but like the notes are actually different in certain types of music from different parts of the world. Like uh, they, they don't have the same, you know, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, the scale is different. The scales. Mm -hmm. The scales are completely different. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like a child. Again. No. <laughs> um, so different different scales. It's it's literally they have more notes and the notes fit in different places. And so my point being, even the basic structure of what we are creating in one place, you know, people would look at that and go, that doesn't work. Doesn't fit onto my onto my my scale here. Doesn't fit here. So obviously it's not good. But no, that's there's a whole art form based around this. It's just beyond your comprehension. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean it's wrong. It means it could be amazing, you know. And so sometimes we have to blast people's minds open and, and you know and kind of just <laughs> get them, whoa, that's amazing. Yeah. But I love that. Follow the follow the was it follow the heat or follow the fire? Follow the heat. Mm. Wherever it's warm, 
you go there. Yeah, you go. It, it, it kind of reminds me of like, um, yeah, what was that? A lot of people talk about saying yes and like just trying things, trying things that you might not think would work artistically mm -hmm. and seeing, seeing how it goes. Now, come back to finding your tribe, finding your, your family. You said family. Uh, I, some people will say tribe, your, your, your group. How did you find these people? Um, yeah, I think that, you know, Jessica, I had known her for like 10 years from, from, from school, from school yeah. teaching. And then Devin, who is the guitarist and vibraphone player I had played in, um, he, he actually like met me. I was performing, uh, I used to perform a lot just by myself solo. Um, and he had found, um, me at a show that we had both been on the bill for and his band was playing new modern warfare. And after my set, he was just like, I've never heard anything, you know, like what you're doing. I'm very interested. It's so beautiful. He's like, I would love to play. So I, I went on to play like viola with him, do uh, backing vocals in his group. Um, and that's where I met um, Tim, my bass player. So Devin and Tim kind of came from the same sort of community. And then I met Alex Milstead, um, the keyboardist in our group. He was actually, he's actually the husband of um, one of our grad school classmates. So his wife went oh, nice. to grad school with, with the Jessica and I. And so we're, we're all kind of connected somehow, which is cool. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the beautiful thing is like, there's always this synchronicity about how people come together. Now, now um, what have you been working on lately? What are some of the projects that you're working on recently? Yeah. Um, so outside of my own project right now, I've been working with uh, No No Boy. So that's uh, Julian and Amelia. Uh, they currently are doing some amazing folk music related to um, reviving Vietnamese, here, Vietnamese history. So nice. he has a very interesting perspective also being half Asian, and half white. And, you know, playing viola with him right now has been really cool. We're actually going to go up to Seattle, I think the second week of January to go play um, on KEXP, the radio station. And it's very cool. Yeah. 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 His, his music is just so healing for me and also to like see that representation awesome. and the images of his past and his family just like merged into this magical storytelling through music. He, um, is also on the, why am I forgetting it? Like the historic folk label, um, that is able to really bring his music to a large audience, which is amazing. Um, and then outside of other people's music, <laughs> uh, <laughs> our group, we're just working on releasing our first album together. So congratulations. Yeah. We've, we've released two singles, um, new love and Jane Jane. And then we have about seven or eight other songs that we're just about done with. And yeah, we're actually working on, um, the next album even. So for 2020, Sweet. yeah, I think it's going to be geared more towards, um, the, the learner's mind, the young mind, um, anyone that's open to receive, um, the joy through, uh, having fun through music. You know, I think I like perspective that. has changed. <laughs> there was, um, it, it, and I like that there was my friend, Tim came on and he was talking about how. Uh, this music producer for Led Zeppelin was taking their music and playing it for, he played it for the, I think it was like Mick Jagger and also George Harrison. And they were like, this is garbage. This is trash. This is horrible. No one's going to like this, man. It's horrible. What are you doing? This, this is, this is absolute garbage. Well, <laughs> it was Led Zeppelin. They went on to become pretty prolific, but so often, when people start doing something new, there's always this pushback. 
there's always this like, well, that's not how things are supposed to sound. That's not the way it's done. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's interesting that, you know, coming back to your, you know, follow the, follow the heat, you know, it's so such great advice because if we can go down that path, if we can kind of dive down into areas where, because also I, I, I would like, it's almost like as well where, where you start feeling a little bit uncomfortable, you know, mm -hmm. you ever, you know, I always think about when I travel somewhere, I hate traveling. <laughs> Not going to lie. Going into airports, you know, all of the security checks, all of the, you know, I, I couldn't handle traveling <laughs> before COVID. Like now it's like so stressful. Like I'm not good in small spaces. But then when I get to the destination, wherever it is, mm -hmm. it's just like, Wow. Sometimes you have to lean into that discomfort. You have to lean into that space of being uncomfortable to really get to something special. You know, when I, when I was getting ready to move overseas, you know, my first, my first couple months living in a new country, I was just like, what is happening? Mm -hmm. And then when you're able to just let go, you enjoy everything. It's kind of like, whether it be the music or the food or the sounds, it's like giving yourself permission to say, yeah, let's play. And so that's what I loved about you talking about for your, your, your next album is like this idea of, of, I was talking to someone recently and I was like, you know, what would be the coolest thing for them to bring to a concert, a giant, you know, those kids birthday parties and they have the, the jumpy castles can you imagine if they had like a giant jumpy castle? Granted, you would have to make it safe. <laughs> but literally probably one of the coolest things ever, you know, to have at a giant concert. But I mean, I'm, granted, probably people. I might take your idea. I have um, right? I'm doing like a, Go for it. a birthday party show for my for my Pisces birthday on February 25th. And uh, we're going to play at the Hollowed Halls there. And, nice. Um you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about the bouncy house now. I'm thinking about it, all the games we're going to play. Like in a lot of our live shows, we, we have that element of fun, you know, like we, um, have a game where people are trying to find a snake and it's hidden in the venue and the song doesn't stop until the snake is found. And though these things traditionally are, are, are like, you know, for, it for kids like yeah right <laughs> the the big kids love it they love they love right. just they do. the moment and so enamored with the idea of fun <laughs> yeah you know you know who i i absolutely love for for something and you, you're like what one of the people that i really crack up about is ed sheeran and there's there's one reason why he doesn't i i'm pretty sure he doesn't take himself that seriously and maybe I'm wrong, but like he cracks me up. Like he just did this cover with Elton John and he was wearing like one of Elton's. He's like, Elton gifted me a tracksuit. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the next one, in the next one, he was wearing this tight little fitting like elf dress. Wow. Like, and, and like, <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> because and, and like, and he's, he's this funny looking little guy who looks like, you know, like Ron from Harry Potter. And then, you know, in his, in his new, in his new music video, he plays this vampire and he's just, wow. And it's so it's, it's hilarious. Like, I mean, but my point being like, if you take life too seriously, mm -hmm. it just, get, life is tough. I know. Life is tough. And you know what? There will be tough moments when we're having fun. It shouldn't be one of them. To take things so seriously is my opinion. Yeah. That, and that reminded me of something that's really funny that my, my drummer does. Please talk. Do tell. So talking about this whole topic of like being in your discomfort, like half of what I do as a teacher is teaching children how to, how to be safe in their discomfort. Right. Um, oh, I love that. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to, to get them to, to feel that and be, and accept that. And that's a feeling that they're allowed to have. You don't have to fight it. Mm -hmm. um, but in one of our songs, uh, the song progressively kind of just comes out of all sense of time, 
at one point we're all playing in different time signatures, different, me- like it's, there's no rhyme or reason. And it's to give space for this type of feeling. But there's also this comedic aspect of like, I didn't know this, but my drummer would actually take his drumsticks and intentionally drop his drumsticks off of the, off of his set and pick them up like as as a, as a as a way to show that it's okay to like let things go like it's okay to That's awesome. it's okay to sound ugly it's okay to make a mess because in the end yeah. we're going to we're going to come back together and it's okay you ever i love that and <laughs> With my daughter, I have to be careful because we are adults are trained toward rigidity. Mm-hmm. We are trained toward towing the line mm-hmm. and she bounces all over the room. And I have two choices. I can validate her calming down, sitting down, sitting in her chair or I can validate the fact that she loves to dance Mm -hmm. and that she just loves to move and she loves to be, and it's a challenge for me. I'm not going to lie. I have to check myself today. She was, I was, I was finishing editing a video and it was just a stressful day today here at home. And she came up and she had some popcorn and she started going (laughs) and chewing the popcorn in my ear. And at first I wanted to be like, stop that. It's annoying Yeah, trying to listen. I was like, Ailani. And I turned around and she just had this look like, and I was like, and I was like, Sean, this is a moment where you can make the right decision. Mm -hmm. And I turned around and I looked at her and I said, do it again. And she went, can't shoot it in my ear again. And I was like, parenting win for the day, you know? And, And so, because I think that we have to remember That it's okay to step outside that box. It's okay to be out of step. It's okay to drop those drumsticks. It's okay. Yeah. And I, I totally identify with, uh, with some things you brought up about your daughter. Like I feel like I learn best through movement. That's like my vehicle of receiving information. And yeah, I think like the more ways that you're able to push that energy in, to an avenue of creativity like that's that's the same way that I teach my kids at school like I don't I don't take the song that we're learning and just you know just shove it at them and tell them to regurgitate what they're hearing like we're gonna put these elements into our body we're going to be feeling the rhythm and 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 creating these beautiful peak experiences together Mm -hmm. but later we can come back to and remember, Oh my goodness. Remember that time we were laughing so hard and we were like moving in this certain way. Well, now we have, um, this mind map that we can derive rhythm or melody from. Yep. And, and you, yep. you have this, this, this chapter that you can reference that you experienced with your body. And so I think that, you know, in a lot of forms of transmission and teaching, we're so concerned about, what's happening on a visual level or like by listening, but we neglect to nourish the body. I think so. I think so. I think that's so true. And, and one of the things is like playing into the other senses. Like I'm already thinking about like tomorrow I'm going to the bookstore. I'm buying little circle sticky things and I'm coming home and I'm putting on each of the keys and I'm coloring them. So we're going to color each one a different color. I'm already, I'm, 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 that's like, seriously, I've been coming back to that. I'm like, I guess like, I'm like, put that aside, Sean, don't think about that during the interview. But like, that's such a brilliant thing. I'm going to, I'm going to totally do it. Mm -hmm. So I love it. Now, if you could go back in time Mm -hmm. and and talk to a younger version of yourself, what advice would you give yourself? Mm -hmm. I would say be ferociously and persistently kind. Ferociously and consistently kind. I love that. Yeah. Talk to me about what that means. You know, I think that a lot of um, modern day musicianship is about 
developing this ego and like this coolness and this rigidness and this yeah. uh, stamp of approval. And we forget that along this path and along our experience, we are meeting amazing human beings that have so much to offer. And if I had been able to focus on just knowing myself and being kinder to myself and others, I think that raises the frequency of opportunity. And okay. if you're to my younger self, you know, if, if I wanted to grow at an exponential rate, that's how I would have wanted myself to navigate the world. Cause that's what I'm doing now. And, you know, if I had done it sooner, I think that those windows of opportunity would be even, even grander. So. Yeah. That's rude. That's beautiful. Yeah. Now, um, if you had Aladdin's lamp, what would you wish for? <laughs> Aladdin's lamp. I guess I would just wish that I could help more people heal, you know, like I have, I have my, I like my 500 music babies that I'm always trying to, um, trying to help and nourish. And, you know, I think that I'm reaching a lot of the adults that have ears for that type of joy that I'm creating, mm -hmm. but I really just want more ways to share my joy. Love that. Yeah. I love that. The opportunity and ways to share your joy. Uh...